Welcome to the Kankakee Valley Genealogical Society's 50th anniversary celebration. My name is Marcia Stang and I am the president of the society. I want to give you a little history towards our beginnings. The first meeting of the society took place on January 16, 1968. Leland Bray was the founder of our society and he became the first vice president and Reginald Cahan became the president. A constitution and bylaws were eventually adopted and plans made for a membership drive. You will see a copy of our crest here on the screen and I'll explain a little about what this all represents. The crossed trade axe and peace pipe above the shield indicates the wars and treaties that took place in the Kankakee Valley area from the time the first wit excuse me, first white settler arrived until the last of the Indian land was sold. The white cross through the center of the shield is for the Christian missionaries who first traveled among the Indians and told of the beautiful land on their return to civilization. The remaining four emblems within the shield are for the four major nationalities that settled the area. Starting at the upper right is the fleur-de-lis for the French and French Canadians. Beneath that is the double-headed eagle, which appeared on many early German flags. To the left of the eagle is a shamrock for the Irish, and above the shamrock is the cross of St. George, which is a part of the flag of England and symbolic in the crest of our English settlers. In the very beginning years of the society, we had 200 members, which was quite an impressive number. One of the sad things about being in existence for 50 years now is that we have lost so many of our early members. Currently, we have um, in the area of 100 members, and about a third of them are out of state. I want to tell you uh, about our current officers. And well, I'm just so happy to tell you that the first three I'm going to be telling you about are 50-year members of our society. And I, I would like you to stand up when I mention your name, please. The first one is Nelda Ravens. And since she's standing up, <laughs> she is a 50-year member. She currently is our treasurer and membership chairman. She serves on the publications and book committees, and she takes care of all of the refreshments at our meetings. She has filled practically every position in the society except as president, and that's because she refuses to do that. <laughs> My second one is our next 50-year member, and it's Betty Schatz. <laughs> Betty is our vice president, our program chairman, and she volunteers one afternoon a week in the genealogy room. The third member, who is 50 years, is Mary Schatz, her sister. <laughs> Mary is... <laughs> Mary is our secretary, and she also volunteers in one afternoon a week in the genealogy room. Um, Jim Anderson is another gentleman who, who does one afternoon a week too. So we have plenty of help in the genealogy room. Ah, okay, uh, something else I need to say about Mary is she, she has been so busy this last year or so because she has been transcribing the St. Rose Volume 3 Book of Records. And so we're kind of hoping by next year we'll have that one available. Both Mary and uh, Betty started out our first quarterly and were editors through 1977. Currently, we have three directors. The first one is Wilfred Mateer. He is a 42-year member in our society. He has served as a director off and on for 15 years, was president from 1980 to 1982, vice president and program chairman from 1986 to 1991. And I think Wilfred, oh, he is here, okay. <laughs> 
Our next director is Harriet Schultz. She is a 20-year member of the Society, and she has helped with the publication of numerous church records, especially the St. Pat's Church records that she did the majority of the work on. And she is one of our regulars at our Wednesday work group. Uh, the third member, uh, the third director is Dee Stone. She's a member for 23 years. She's also served as librarian and helped with the indexing of the obituary files. The next lady I want to tell you about isn't here, and I'm sorry to say that. Um, she is a 38-year member, and she has served as our hospitality chairman from 1998 through 2018. She always makes sure that any of our members, if they're sick, she sends them get well cards, and if, any, and if they lose any family members, she sends out sympathy cards. Marge is 98 years old. <laughs> Well, I guess now I better tell you about me. I'm a 35-year member of the Society. I am the president, and I am the editor of the Quarterly. Like Nelda, I have held pretty much most of the different positions in the Society. Uh, in fact, I took over as Quarterly from Nelda with Volume 16 in 1986, and I'm cur currently working on Volume 48. As Nelda says, I'll never get rid of this job. But in reality, I actually really enjoy being the editor. <laughs> and speaking of editors, we'll talk about our web page editor. Lee Hollenbeck, is Lee, there's Lee. <laughs> she is a 21-year member of our society. And shortly after she joined, she came up to me at one of our meetings and asked me if I would like for her to create a web page for us. And I was, I was thrilled. <laughs> so she, she took on that task, and by 1998, we had a web page. Lee continued on as web page editor in 2000, until 2006 when she moved out to California. As you can see now, she is, is back again. But during her absence, we were very, very lucky to have Dale Monty, who is a 12-year member, take over for her. <laughs> Where is Dale? <laughs> Dale is responsible for scanning our 72,000-plus obituaries and posting them on our website. This is a continuing project with the society, and so that is only going to grow and grow. And Without Dale, this would have never gotten off the ground because it was an overwhelming job in the beginning. Um, our librarian for the society is currently Doris O'Connor, and I saw Doris earlier. Ah, and she's a 15 member year member of our society. We have uh, weekly meetings at my house where we work on many of the genealogical projects, and I want to tell you a little bit about our regulars. Norma Meyer, and I know she's there somewhere. <laughs> Norma Meyer, a 39-year member, she has transcribed the church records from Maternity BVM Catholic Church, Volume 1 and 2, St. Rose Catholic Church, Volume 1 or 2, St. George Catholic Church, and St. John the Baptist Church in Larab, Volume 1 or 2. She is also the genealogist at the French Heritage Museum and if you have any French Canadian ancestors, definitely go over and see Norma. <laughs> she has helped just countless people. <laughs> and on our Wednesday group, she spends the week clipping all the obituaries out of the newspapers and brings them on the Wednesday group. And she, along with Judy Gerke, a six-year member, mount all these obituaries on sheets so Dale can scan them and we can get them up on the website. Other projects that we're doing on Wednesdays is proofreading church records and working on our scrapbooks. Kathy Roworth, she's a 22-year member with us. She has been just really helping out and with taking care and updating our scrapbooks. Uh, Rose Hedger, a 19-year member, and Bernie Hartman, an 18-year member, spend Wednesdays proofreading our church records. Uh, 
Uh, we are very happy today to have Dorothy Regal back with her because she hasn't been a, a, a real regular as of late, but she is a 24-year member who served as research chairman from 2002 until 2016. She helped countless peoples find their ancestors in Kankakee County. Bonnie Bergeron is here with us today and she is a 26-year member. She served as vice president in 1983 and 1984. She was publicity chairman in 1984 and secretary in 1987. Jim Birkenbeal is also with us. He is a 25-year member. He is a past vice president and program chairman from 1999 to 2004. He also served on the book committee and made cemetery maps for many of our cemeteries in the county. Our 50th anniversary celebration committee included Ruth Lemie, a nine-year member, Marianne Lambert, a five-year member, Deborah Lambert, a three-year member, along with Nelda Ravens, Betty Schatz, Mary Schatz, Harriet Schultz, Kathy Roworth, Lee Hollenbeck, and myself. We also have two members that are not local from the county, and I can't see her, but Marion, would you stand up, Marion Beagle? She is a 25-year member who comes to us from Tinley Park. But we also have members that came from quite a bit farther. Dr. David Shobar and his wife, Janet, have come from Sioux City, Iowa, to be here today for the celebration. <laughs> Our society has walked all but one of the 63 cemeteries in the county and documented these records in 17 different publications. We have copied original church records for 15 churches in the county and have published them. We are hoping uh, within, well, by the beginning of next year, to have the St. Paul Episcopal Church records ready, as well as the St. Rose Volume 3 book. Um, we have a very hardworking society. And the one thing I've always said about genealogists is they are the most generous people you're ever going to want to meet. Uh, they're always willing to give their time. They're always willing to help out anyone else who needs help. I am so appreciative for all these incredible people because they keep our society going. I thank you for coming and I hope you're gonna enjoy our celebration today. Thank you. And I was just gonna say, and I'm giving it now to Betty. <laughs> I also am, I want to welcome you here today. I'm so happy to see so many people. Uh, our, first, our first speaker this morning is Jack Clacy. Uh, everybody knows Jack, I think, or at least is familiar with him. He came to Kankakee in 1963 as a young reporter for the Kankakee Daily Journal. He became hooked on local history almost immediately and has been involved in local history ever since. Uh, he co-authored a book called Of the People, A Popular History of Kankakee in 1968 in preparation for the 1976 bicentennial celebration for the United States. He is now retired. He continues his interest in Kankakee history. He volunteers at the Kankakee County Museum and uh, we all avidly wait for his uh, articles on a bit of local history in the weekend edition of the Kankakee Daily Journal each week. So, we all welcome Jack Clacy.
Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Betty for that nice introduction and uh, Marcia for filling us in on all of the history of the Genealogical Society. Probably one way to uh, open the story is uh, to give you my favorite definition of history. And I don't know where this came from. I remember reading it many years ago and it made a good impression on me. History is an inaccurate record of events which shouldn't have happened written by someone who wasn't there. <laughs> well, we hope our history here is a little more accurate, fingers crossed. As a uh, trained journalist in my younger days, I learned to try to get it right. And I hope that's continued through the years as I've done a lot of writing on local events and local history. Right now, though, I'd like to ask you to join me in a little bit of time travel. I'm sitting right where we are. Let's go back to the year 1853. So we're zipping a long way back, specifically to July 4th. Don't look for fireworks. There wasn't any Kankakee City at that time. But what I want you to do is imagine where you are right now in 1853. Among other things, you'd be up in the top of the trees of the forested area that ran along what's now Court Street, the ridge behind us here. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of look around and see what we can see. If we looked straight ahead and straight down, you'd see a trail running through this wooded area. Pretty well-worn trail. Looks like you've been here for quite a long time. And it was. It was the Indians and various early pioneers and so forth traveled this trail. Let's look to the east right now. If we look east, along the trail, through the woods, about roughly two blocks away from here, about where Harrison Avenue is right now, the trail angled to the south, and there's a bit of a clearing there, where, but roughly where the, warehouse, or where the courthouse stands today. You notice what, probably the only dwelling within what is now the boundaries of the city of Kankakee, or at least the earlier boundaries of the city of Kankakee. It's a tumble-down log cabin and some cleared ground. That cabin was used probably some 20 years earlier by uh, Francois Bourbonnet, Jr., who was the son of French-Canadian trader Francois Bourbonnet and his Potawatomi life cat wife, Katish. Uh, he later moved away from there, and the cabin just sort of fell apart, but when this area in July of 1853, that was about the only sign of human habitation within eyesight of here. If we were looking down the, the trail, you might see a uh, man on horseback heading this direction from the southeast. And it could have been possibly William Baker. William Baker had come here in 1832, and along that trail, right where what is now called Baker Creek crosses the trail. He built a uh, structure that was called Baker's Tavern. And of course, in those days, a tavern was much more than just a drinking place. Frequently, it was a habitation and a, a hostelry or an inn for travelers going along the trail. Uh, Baker, by the way, was the father of the first white child born in with current confines of Kankakee County. His daughter was born, I believe, in 1836. I forgot to make a note on my notes, but it was a very early 1830s. That trail, if you followed it for some distance, would eventually cross the river down about where, Wal uh, where uh, uh, Waldron, or in this case, Aroma Park, is now, would skirt around the base of Mount Langham and head off to the southeast till eventually getting down to Danville and even beyond that to Vincennes, Indiana. The, the Wabash Valley was quite a well-settled agricultural area, and there was quite a bit of travel back and forth between there and Chicago. Let's come back to where we are right now, and we're going to look west. If we look west along the trail, you can see that the, the wooded area, which was pretty much surrounding this area up to the river, uh, is succeeded on the other side of the river by grasslands, the beginning of the Grand Prairie. The Grand Prairie, which stretched 
basically from just to the west of here, beyond the Mississippi and well into the west, was a tall grass prairie. That sometimes some of the native grasses were as tall as a person on horseback could just barely see over the top of those grasses. But the wooded areas, you tend to think of an area like this as being, you know, deep woods. And everywhere to the east, it pretty much was. But here, the wooded areas, other than in this area and in the eastern part of the county, tended to just follow the water courses. So basically, if you looked out to the west, you was, if you saw a line of trees, there was a creek or a river running in that area. Uh, if we followed the trail from here down to the ba near the banks of the river, it would then turn northeast, or sorry, northwest, and would come across a small settlement of French Canadian pioneers called Bourbonnais or La Pointe, any number of different names. Uh, that was one of the most settled areas in 1853 in the county. There were other settlements, Moments, some down around Waldron and so forth, but basically speaking, Bourbonnais and Moments were probably the two largest concentrations of. Uh, population, and they weren't very large, several hundred people at the most each. Now, if we're, again, we're back at this position. Maybe we're on a flying carpet above those trees or so, otherwise we might fall off. But if we look to the northwest, you might see a plume of smoke among the trees. And if you listen closely, you could possibly have heard a, a, uh, a whistle or kind of a chuffing sound there was a locomotive down there. The Illinois Central Railroad's first work train, their first train coming down this area, arrived here on the 4th of July, 1853. And the train was essentially a work train carrying materials for extension of the line. The rails at that time, on that date, ran to about Hickory Street. Work was going on on the bridge across the river. And uh, there were, of course, gangs of workmen, most of whom lived in a, a work camp area called Sacramento, just south of the river, roughly where uh, the end across the Washington, what's now the Washington Street Bridge. Significance of that train arriving on the 4th of July, 1853, was Kankakee, which didn't really exist yet had finally become a destination. We were at the end of the railroad line and would then be part of that railroad line and its extension for ever since then. By 1854, there were some people here. Actually, by 1854, there were probably several hundred. There was a lot of building going on, uh, small stores, some houses, and so forth. In 1854, the Associates Land Company, which was allied to the, uh, to the Illinois Central and actually worked on this, laid out town sites and promoted the use of towns, pr did its first plat map. And it was for a town that it called Bourbon A. But it was the town right here. It was something like 28 blocks, I believe, but a pretty good sized town for that day. Uh, although the Associates Land Company called the town Bourbon A. The railroad called it Kanki Depot. And for some very strange reason, there was a post office here, and it was named Clarksville. <laughs> so, so mass confusion. And if you're if you were a fan of the monkeys on uh, the old days, of course, last train to Clarksville. This apparently was the first train to Clarksville that came in on 1853. <clears throat> I think now that we've established where Kankakee is, even though there wasn't much here at the time, it's time to come back from our time travel and get into just general listening to what's going on and listening to history. We have to go back a little further. Let's go back to the 1700s. In 1700s, the Potawatomi tribes, which basically were located at that time or before that time in Michigan and Wisconsin began filtering into this area, more or less filling a void that was left when the Illini were wiped out. Uh, and so therefore the northeastern Illinois became 
Potawatomi hunting and settling grounds. Uh, they were never horribly uh, populous. There were probably several thousand individuals by the 1850s when, or the 1830s and so forth when they dealt with treaties. There were a number of villages here. Uh, the largest was Shawanasi's village, or, or rock, uh, rock Village, on the banks of the Rock Creek, out of what is now the State Park. Uh, but there were others also. Soldier's Village, near the mouth of what we call Soldier Creek. Uh, Yellowhead, up in the timber up near Grant Park. Uh, Wysos Cook, at the junction of the Iroquois and the Kankakee Rivers, roughly what was called Waldron or is now Aroma Park. And then down in Watsika uh, area, Tamain. So these were all villages of the, the Potawatomi. And these were the people that were encountered by the first fur traders, to, the first Europeans really to come more or less permanently. There were people passing through, of course, missionaries and travelers and so forth. but. The traders began to start dealing with the Indians in about 1822 or 1823. Uh, Noel Levasseur and, uh, talk about going blank, <laughs> Hubbard. <laughs> I can't think of his first name. Gordon Hubbard, Gordon Salt and Stall Hubbard. Sorry, thank you. Senior moment. <laughs> anyway, set up a trading post at what they called Bunkum which is roughly currently where the village of Iroquois is in Iroquois County. Uh, traded there for quite a while. Hubbard eventually moved to Chicago to become a very prominent citizen. Uh, but Levasseur remained and he, he moved north. Came up to an area which is where, well, roughly the center of Bourbonnais right now, uh, where he found a an old French-Canadian trader named Francois Bourbonnet Sr. living in a log cabin there and trading with the Potawatomi. <coughs> oh, uh, he settled into the area and began to cultivate land. He traded with the Indians and over a period of years began encouraging his fellow French-Canadians to move into the area. A big change came in 1832 and 1833 when the Potawatomi made treaties with the United States to cede their lands in northeastern Illinois. And this was the last large swath of Illinois that was still under Indian ownership. Uh, roughly speaking, if you followed Interstate 55 out of Chicago down to the point where it crosses the Kankakee, that was an Indian boundary line. and that marked more or less the northern edge of the Potawatomi's land. What they ceded in that treaty of 1832 and in 1833 at Chicago was a great deal of land south of there down well, well beyond the, bottom, the lower edge of Iroquois County and some of the associated areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under those treaties, certain individuals in uh, among the Potawatomi, both uh, full-blooded Potawatomi and, th and their children, sometimes frequently, uh, what do you guess you would say, half-breed, they were French-Canadian and, and, and uh, Potawatomi, children of those families, were granted individual reservations for their use. These are not like the reservations out west, which are large, permanent, whole tribe reservations. These were strictly for the use of an individual for and there was some question about whether it was for lifetime interest or permanent. It eventually got settled that it was, they actually were not just a lifetime interest because the Potawatomi generally fairly quickly sold those lands to uh, Eastern speculators who were buying them up for use. For example, uh, most of that was before 1839, most of those reservations, which included all the choice lands along the river from Rock Creek all the way down to what is now Kankakee and the various, some of the village sites. One of the choicest, of course, was something, uh, the reservation called Martino's Reservation. Martino was the daughter of Francois Bourbonnet Jr. And her reservation, you're sitting in it right now. 
it was essentially what is now central Kankakee. In 1847, a man named Isaac Elson was one of the speculators who was buying up Indian lands. And for uh, $3 an acre, or a total of $1,920 for 640 acres, he bought all of this land. That was not quite as good a deal as the, the famous one from the east where Peter Minuet back in the 1600s bought all of Manhattan Island for about $24, but it was still a pretty good deal. <laughs> uh, by the late 1830s, all the Potawatomi had essentially moved west to new lands and new reservations in Missouri and later in Kansas. So now we reach a situation where we have this wide open country, uh, a lot of resources, a lot of game, a lot of very fertile land, and not many inhabitants. We've had over the years trickling from the 1830s up to basically the 1840s or, uh, or so, you had a trickling of settlers mostly coming east or westward from Indiana and Ohio and points beyond wanted to get out on the frontier and be able to uh, settle in uncharted land that was getting away from neighbors or having a place to have a good farm. But more concentrated colonization of the area came actually in, in three waves. The earliest was Noel Levasseur, as we mentioned earlier, in, settled in Bourbonnais. In 1836, he went back to French Canada and began promoting the idea of, boy, there's all this terrific land out here. It's inexpensive. It's a dollar and a quarter an acre. Uh, and it's nice, rich land. The French in Canada at that time were in a period of unrest anyway. They were very unhappy with the, the British overlords and so forth. And many of them uh, decided they wanted to migrate somewhere. Large migration went to the northeast where but a smaller, and originally in, in the eight, late 1830s, relatively small migration came here. There were dozens of families, at least, uh, were attracted to Lavasser's new area around Bourbonnais. In the 1850s, uh, you had two, pos two areas of in immigration. One was Father Charles Shinicky, who was a Catholic priest who was a scientist. He was had been very well known in Canada as a temperance crusader, and he decided to come to Illinois, and essentially was in this area in the early 1850s. Was the pastor of Maternity BVM Church in 1853, uh, early early 1850s. The he had an idea of he wanted to build a colony here. Well, after there's a lot of controversy over his tenure in Bourbonnais, uh, the church burned down. He said the previous pastor had burned it down. The previous pastor said he had burned it down. In any case, lots of controversy, and that was not the only controversy about Shuniki. I see Bonnie Bergeron nodding her head over there. She knows. <laughs> Shuniki, of course, later uh, was excommunicated from the Catholic Church when had his priestly powers removed. and eventually became a Presbyterian minister. Uh, but that's another part of the story a little bit later. In 53, he moved down to what is now St. Anne, said, hey, this is a good place. I'm gonna settle this place. I'm gonna get a lot of people there. And he did, he brought hundreds of families literally over a period of time to settle in the St. Anne area, Papinaw, Beaverville, which at that time was called St. Mary's. Uh, and it was a very large migration. Now the French Canadians, and later in later cases, and I know Norma would jump on me if I don't mention this, the uh, French-speaking Belgians who settled down around La Rabe were part of, not, not of Shinnegy's migration, but they did move into this area. We also had some people coming directly from France. But there were other strains of immigration, and the one most possible for that was the Illinois Central Railroad. They strongly promoted immigration to this area because they had land for sale. They had been given hundreds of thousands of acres of land to finance the building of the IC. In fact, every alternate section of land, each square mile of land, 
alternately on either side of those tracks for the entire length of the, for five miles on either side for the entire length of the railroad through Illinois. So they had a lot of land to sell and uh, they were busy selling it. They had agents on the docks in New York because there was a strong emigra emigration from Europe at that time because of a lot of unrest there. And so they would sign people up on the docks, put them on a, a train or whatever means to get them out here and settle them in the land. A lot of those earlier immigrants were German. Uh, there were still, in the 1960s, if I remember when I came here, up in Will County, some of the areas up in there, there were some small German Lutheran churches up there where sermons were still preached in German. And that traced all the way back to settlements brought in by the IC. And of course, in 1960, in Bourbonnais, you still had a lot of old grandmères who were still speaking the French-Canadian patois. <laughs> uh, Irish settled in here mostly, again, probably fairly early because they were laborers on the Illinois Central Railroad construction. So you had, and then you had a later uh, group of, of, or not a group, but many individuals of Irish extraction who ended up here. Of course, we have had a fairly large Italian population, uh, Greek, a little bit of everything, Polish and so forth. And a lot of those, were, again, were due to the colonization work of the Illinois Central. I mentioned some of the other settlements in the area that were essentially French. Uh, Petty Canada, out near uh, Davis Creek or Little Canada. St. George, and of course, down in Iroquois, uh, La Rab and Papineau and St. Mary's, which became Beaverville. But also, other settlements, Moments was the capital of eastern Illinois at that, or eastern Kankakee County at the time, even before it was a Kankakee County. Uh, Rockville, which was in the vicinity where the old Rock Village was, and Aroma. In 1853, these were all somewhat settled areas. The Kankakee, uh, excuse me, the Illinois Central, as I mentioned, was a major settler of the area with its uh, immigration policies. There's a persistent tale that the conservative old burghers out in Bourbonnais didn't want the railroad to come through there. It was going to upset their peaceful way of life, and they turned down the possibility of being on the road. Said, "I say, no, we don't want you to stop here." Uh, that's bunk. <laughs> the Illinois Central had a specific policy of whenever possible bypassing existing communities and setting up its own. It bypassed Bourbon A and set up Kankakee. Uh, down in Iroquois County, it passed up a settlement called Spring Creek, which was one of the few settlements in that area, set up Onarga. And Champaign and Urbana, I can remember, never remember which one is which. One exists, I believe the Champaign existed and they set up Urbana, but it may have been the other way around. I have to check my, but anyway, the reason for this, there's a lot more money to be made selling urban city lots by the square foot basically than selling agricultural land at a dollar and a quarter by the acre. So all of the towns essentially along the IC, almost all of those were set up by the Illinois Central through a subsidiary called the Associates Land Company or other subsidiaries. And they laid out the towns and sold the lots to residents and to businesses and so forth and essentially populated the area. Uh, there is a, uh, excuse me, lost, lost track of where I was. <laughs> We haven't talked about where the county came from first, of course. Before there was a town, there had to be a county, I guess, or one way or the other. In 1852, actually 1851, the area that is now Kankakee County was split between two, two other counties. North of the river, where we are, was part of Will County. South of the river was part of Iroquois County. and. Uh, they were pretty imbalanced in terms of population. Will County, totally, not just this area, 
uh, in, I'm going to get my note here. In 1850, the population of Will County was 16,700 people, and Iroquois was 4,140 people. So the, <laughs> Iroquois particularly was not overly populated, it still isn't. But uh, the first, the people who lived in those areas, especially close what is now Kankakee County, said, boy, it's an awful long way to get to the county seat. It might take me a day or more to get there if I have to go record a deed or have anything to do with government. If you were uh, south of the river, you had to go down to Middleport, which is north of Watsika, which was the county seat at that time. Or if you lived north of the river, you had to go all the way to Joliet. So there was agitation to set up a new county that would be much closer to the people who lived here. On April 1st, 1851, there was an election held to set up the county of Kankakee. Well, unfortunately, Iroquois, excuse me, Will County's voters said, yeah, we want a new county. People on Iroquois said, no, we don't want it. So they voted, and it had to be majority in both areas to be able to set it up. They tried again in 1852 on February 11th. Uh, again, Will County voted strongly yes, and this time it looked like Iroquois had voted in favor of it too. Uh, there was supposedly a majority of a couple hundred votes. But the election was contested. Somebody <coughs> said, nah, no, no, there's fraud here. You know, how strange, election fraud in Illinois. <laughs> Uh, supposedly, out in Limestone, which was an Iroquois County uh, precinct at that time, they had a 320 votes in favor of New County and zero votes against it. But in the previous election, there had been only 96 votes in that area, and uh, I think only about half of them were in favor of. of so. What supposedly happened was the Illinois Central, uh, which had a stake in getting a new county started, had uh, run all of its laborers through the Limestone Township Precinct to vote in favor of the thing. And the, they didn't even live here. They were here temporarily. But the IC said, oh, I think it'd be a good idea. Let's do a little vote fraud and get this done. You know. Well, <clears throat> this got stuck in the machinery of state government for a while, so it didn't get resolved immediately. But there was a problem. The vote, or the resolution for setting up the county said, okay, we have to hold an election on May 9th to elect county officers and decide where a county seat will be. <laughs> they debated and they finally said, okay, well, the county is, the state is still trying to decide this. We better go ahead and hold the election so they did, and the first slate of county officers was elected, but they couldn't decide on a county seat. There were four candidates, uh, Bourbon A, Moments, Aroma, and Kankakee, which wasn't yet, but would be eventually. Uh, and nobody got a majority in that, so that was left hanging in midair. Finally, uh, later in, several months later, the Secretary of State of Illinois ruled that, yes, the election was valid, uh, therefore the county could be set up, and we already had, of course, the government in place. We still were looking for a uh, county seat, though, so they had another election on the 21st of June, 1853. Again, note that this was before the first train got here and before there were any buildings in, except that ramshackle cabin in Kankakee. Uh, the city or the city to be of Kankakee was chosen over Moments as the county seat. Uh, I see had done a couple things to help out the cause of its town. They donated. They said they would donate a square block of land and five thousand dollars to build a courthouse if Kankakee was chosen for the seat. And they also, in the uh, tradition of the last election, uh, ran all of their. Uh, laborers through the, through the voting process out in Limestone and various other places, so Kankakee won quite handily. Now, okay, so now we have a county. We've got a county government, but there's no place for the county board to meet and so forth. They met in moments <laughs> at, the, uh, at the home of, 
Yeah. Philip Wooster, who was the first county judge. Now, we've talked about town sites before. It's kind of interesting. Kankakee, of course, was special because it was considered, it was going to, it was planned to be the largest town in this section of the railroad. And so it had its own plats, of course. We had, sometimes people wonder, where, where did the name Schuyler Avenue come from? Well, Robert Schuyler was the president of the IC. <laughs> Uh, we used to have a town, a, a street called Matson, M-A-T-T-E-S-O-N, which is Chestnut, I believe. Now, that was named for Joel Matson, who was the governor of Illinois at that time. But anyway, the other than that, most of the streets in what is now downtown Kankakee, at least, are the same as on the original plat. Merchant Street was called Merchant's Street at the time, but that was one of the few differences. But other towns, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Smaller communities like Shabance and Mantino, particularly, which were expected to be about the same size. Both those were laid out in 1854, and they were laid out on a standard plat. David Neal, who was one of the um, directors of the Illinois Central and very powerful man, came up with what he called a standard town plat for towns of that, that were expected to be of that size. It was all centered on the railroad depot. Railroad Depot, east and west, east of the Railroad Deeper Depot, there were several streets with a given order of tree names, you know, Oak, Chestnut, and so forth. West, another set of tree names. The east-west streets, though, were unusually named. The first east-west street north of the depot was called First North Street, then Second North Street, Third North Street, et cetera. Same way south, First South Street, Second South Street, Third South Street. There are very few examples of those left. Mantino no longer has that, or they renamed their east-west streets at some point. But Chabance still has First North Street and First, Second, and I think Third South Street. But, and there are a few others along the Illinois Central Line and various other small towns that retain part of that, but it's very unusual. Kentucky grew rapidly. Uh, once the railroad was here. 1855, we had a population of 2,500 people. This is two years after, you know, there was nothing here. Uh, by 1856, another 1,000 people, it was 3,650 on there in that year. And at that time, in 1856, there were 820 houses in Kankakee, five churches, five schools, 72 stores, more than there are now, three hotels, one sawmill, two flour mills, and five factories. So we were a pretty prosperous place at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mantino and Chabance had the same kind of growth. When they were found, both of those were founded in 1854. By 1855, Mantino had 175 people, and by 1856, it had grown to 750. Chabance started out in 19, 1855 with 25 residents and had 600 by the next year. So the area was growing very rapidly. By the eight, early 1860s, we were a pretty prosperous farming community. Kanki was the market town and so forth. There was a lot going on. There were more railroads coming through the area. Uh, the Chicago, Danville, and Vincennes went through a moment, St. Anne and Grant Park in the 1860s. Uh, Cincinnati, Lafayette, and Chicago. Uh, St. Anne, Roma, and Kankakee in 1872, and then over in the western part of the county, the Chicago and Southwestern branched off from the IC to go through Irwin, Hersher, Cabery, and eventually Bloomington. Uh, all of these railroads helped to carry away the, the produce of this area to the markets. This is a very important thing for the farmers is to be able to get their crops to market. Before the railroads were there, they had to do this by, uh, by wagon or if they had livestock, by a cattle drive. At this point, a great deal of the uh, prairie land to the west of here was, had been plowed into into farm fields, and that was a tough job because that prairie grass had extremely tough roots. Uh, the development of a breaking plow pulled by a couple yoke of oxen or sometimes four oxen 
made that possible to cut through those tough roots. Uh, our industries at that time were mostly kind of local. We didn't have a lot of exporting type industries. They, you had sawmills and grist mills, blacksmith shops, foundries, a shoe factory, a uh, wagon factory, things of this sort. They were mostly of a local nature. When the Civil War came along, uh, a lot of young patriotic men immediately joined up. Phil will do a, a lot more extensive touch on this later this afternoon, I'm sure. But uh, it had a big effect on farming because you were losing your labor force. That's where things like the McCormick Reaper and so forth made it possible for farmers to continue operating even though they didn't have the manpower that they had previously. In the Civil War, we had young people in many regiments, but there were two primarily drawn, their membership drawn from this area. One was the, the 76th Illinois Volunteer Infantry and the other was the 113th Volunteer Infantry. Both of these had kind of interesting stories, and I will touch on them very lightly because, again, I don't want to step on Phil's presentation. But the 76th was part of Grant's army, who fought at you know, the Western Theater primarily. But they ended up, though, actually involved in the last battle of the Civil War after Lee had already surrendered. Uh, Lee surrendered in Appomattox, but a couple of days after that, down in Alabama, it was the Battle of Mobile Bay, and the 76th was one of the major <coughs> combatants there. Lieutenant William Kanaga, Kanaga was an officer in the 76th and was cited for bravery. He was, during the charge, he was, or during the, on the, the fighting, he was shot in the leg and slowed him down a little bit. Then he was shot in the other ankle. He ended up continuing his charge on his hands and on his knees, uh, was cited for bravery, and came back to Kankakee County where he was voted into office as the county clerk. Led an illustrious career, including being one of our first historians. He was one of the co-authors of the first history of Kankakee County. It was part of the 1883 Atlas. <coughs> Excuse me, the 113th uh, fought at Vicksburg and various points there. And again, both these regiments had a very high percentage of Kanki and Iroquois County men. Just a couple to touch on real quickly. Gabriel Durham, who was a member of the 12th Illinois Cavalry. Uh, Durham family was, of course, settled basically in the area that is now where the Perry Farm is. And Durham and his brother owned a bookshop and uh, ran a small newspaper in Kankakee at the time the war began. Gabriel joined up and his, his cavalry unit fought in the first day at Gettysburg and William Durham was seriously wounded by an artillery blast and died a few days later and he is always considered to be by most many authorities the first person to fall in the Battle of Gettysburg. From the 113th, Sergeant Charles Dennison was among the many Union soldiers who were routed and captured at the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads in Mississippi. Uh, and he ended up in a place called Andersonville Prison Camp. Charles Dennison kept a diary, three inches tall, about an inch and a half, two inches wide, little leather bound booklet written in very, very tiny script in pencil where he cataloged his day and his feelings on things all the time he was in the Andersonville prison camp. I had the privilege a number of years ago of transcribing that entire diary with the aid of a magnifying glass, by the way. <laughs> uh, and for many years now, we've had a copy of the uh, book with transcribed Dennison Diary for sale at the museum store. Uh, it's fascinating. He didn't write a lot each day because he didn't have much room, but uh, he wrote a lot about how he felt, his health, observations. Uh, they were able to get, even despite the fact they were in a prison camp, they were able to get news. They got the news of the, uh, the fall of Atlanta, for example. And, uh, and he survived the war, came back here, and 
bought a farm just south of where the Kankakee Airport is right now and lived there for many years. On the home front, one of the biggest landowners in the area, a very prominent man named Lemuel Milk, uh, eventually he owned as much as 25,000 acres in Illinois and Indiana and mostly sharecropped or rented out those farms to farmers and to cattle raisers. He had a lot of other interests. He had a huge general store in Chabance. Uh, he also, he lived up on Indiana Avenue <coughs> and he had a very nice house and behind it he had a, a carriage house built of native stone back in probably the early 1860s. That's still probably the oldest existing building in downtown Kankakee and right now it's the Stone Barn, our French Heritage Museum in town, which by the way, unfortunately, conflict you won't be able to, go, except for Norma, you won't be able to go over there this afternoon where uh, we're doing, Norma is doing a, a Ponton family genealogical program there. But uh, if you haven't been to the Stone Barn on a Saturday afternoon when they're open, please go. It's a fascinating place. There's an excellent uh, exhibits and there's also of course all the help of genealogy. Andrew will there be there helping you <laughs> among others. Uh, Lemuel Milk, and I'll just touch this very briefly because it's a whole other story, owned a lot of land across the Indiana border that was a swamp. It was uh, actually the great Grand Kankakee Marsh which was the Everglades of the North. Uh, he had a lot to do with draining that <laughs> so that he could sell it to, to uh, so sell the land for farming. Uh, he hired a gang of laborers and at one point they removed a limestone ledge in the Kankakee River at Moments which was acting as something of a dam and that ended up lowering the water level throughout that uh, huge expanse where, uh, across on Indiana. There's a lot of questions morally whether, he was, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing but just wanted to mention that. We're in the, oops, there we are. There were some interesting things happening in the county during the 1860s through the 1880s that are still with us to some extent. Uh, on September 10th, 1865, a, a Viatorian priest named Father Peter Baudouin and two Viatorian brothers, Martel and Bernard, arrived in Bourbonnais to open a boys' school for the young men of the community. Over a fairly short period of time that evolved into a university. Uh, in 1874, St. Viator's College received its university charter from the state of Illinois and it was a thriving educational operation, uh, very much the heart of the French-Canadian community there until 1938 when other things happened. The, uh, the uh, depression caught up with it. Uh, even earlier, uh, in 1860, several nuns from the congregation in Notre Dame from Montreal came to Bourbonnais at the behest of the, the pastor at Maternity BVM Church to open a girls' school. They had a school for young girls that eventually, by within a couple of years, became uh, Notre Dame Academy and was a, through many years, actually was a large boarding school for young ladies. At one time there were the grade school and the high school operation, but later the boarders became pretty much just the high school students. The same nuns in 1865 opened a school called St. Joseph's Seminary over on Merchant Street at uh, 4th Avenue next to what is now St. Rose Church. And St. Rose Seminary, I'm sorry, St. Joseph's Seminary uh, lasted well into the 18, 1960s. An even bigger operation, and one that continues with us today in many ways, uh, in 1877, the state of Illinois had a number of hospitals for the mentally ill in, scattered in different parts of the state, but there was nothing really in the eastern 
northeastern area, uh, and there was nothing really serving this big Chicago market. So they decided they were going to set up a, an Eastern, Illinois Eastern State Hospital. But as far as locating where that hospital was going to be, there was a state commission that heard proposals from various communities. Uh, the Kankakee delegation toured the commissioners, of course, around the area, talked about the area we had. And then they, at the meeting, I believe in Springfield, they made a strong presentation. And they won out over a number of other communities for this new mental hospital. Uh, there's a persistent folk tale in Kankakee that uh, Kankakee could have had the University of Illinois, but they thought there'd be more jobs in a, in a mental hospital, so they decided instead they'd have the, uh, have the state hospital. Nope. <laughs> uh, University of Illinois was founded in 1867 in Urbana and was a strong going concern 10, ten years before uh, the Illinois Eastern State Hospital was decided upon. There was never any question of do you want this or do you want that. Talk about public works jobs. When the Illinois Central, oh, excuse me, when the, the hospital was built over, well, there was construction going on for probably close to 40 or 50 years or maybe even later, but the heaviest part was in the 1870s and 80s, uh, provided a huge number of jobs for stonemasons and carpenters and all kinds of construction personnel. Uh, a lot of sales for local materials and so forth too. So Illinois Eastern State Hospital in 1910 became Kankakee State Hospital and then in later years was changed to Shapiro Developmental Center and of course is still with us. Uh, it's, Illinois Eastern State Hospital was known for one particular thing. They changed the philosophy of the treatment of the mentally ill over a period of time. At the time it was founded, the uh, mental hospital was set up in a certain in something called the Kirkbride Plan, which was large centralized buildings with huge wards uh, for people and a kind of a one-size-fits-all treatment. There was a philosophy called the Cottage Plan, which s settled on the idea of smaller, still quite large, I mean, maybe you know, 50 or 60 people, uh, separate buildings with their own staff and where there was a much more individualized treatment. The central part of the Illinois State, uh, Illinois, Eastern Illinois Hospital, the clock tower building that we're all familiar with, was built on the Kirkbride plan originally. So two big wings, women on one side, men on the other, several stories high. But at the same time, they also began building cottages. I think there were 10 or so at first, maybe a dozen. <clears throat> and so they ran both ways. And eventually it became a model uh, for mental hospitals in the, in the United States. I'm running a little late here, so I will try to speed things up a bit. Uh, we're up to about the 1880s, 1890s now. Biggest event probably of the 1890s, there were a lot of them, but locally, a uh, promoter named Herman Hardebeck uh, noticed there was this great big gap between the north edge of Kankakee and the south edge of Bourbonnet. It was all farmland at that time. So, you know, that'd be a pretty good place to subdivide and build a uh, an industrial community because industry was booming at that time, the early 1890s. So he laid out a community that he called North Kankakee. His original intention was that it was going to be part of the city of Kankakee. And he began promoting it uh, as a place to move to. But if you were going to move there, you had to have a job. So uh, he also recruited industry. And he concentrated on the furniture industry managed to actually get four pretty good-sized companies, a Demi and Dirks furniture factory, which at the time it opened was the world's largest furniture factory. Uh, there was a company called Ideal Folding Bed. Turk Manufacturing, which of course the company is still with us in terms of retail, uh, and the Gibbs Chair Company. These plants went up when they were booming in the early 1890s. 1891 is when he laid out the town, but within a couple of years, there were, you know, 
hundreds of residents. There were plenty of jobs. The, the factories were going well. And then the uh, 1893 depression hit. <laughs> and the, gradually the factories were closing down. They also were closing down in Kankakee. You had uh, a number of factories here that were badly uh, affected by that and a lot of businesses. So it looked like, unfortunately, North Kankakee was going to go in the tank and be a wasteland. Hardebeck was not going to be stopped, though. He wanted his town to grow. And by this time, uh, they had not connected to Kankakee. had set up as a separate community. Nelda will catch me if I'm saying anything mis <laughs> misstatement about Bradley here, but they were already the village of Bradley, at the, or the village of North Kankakee at that time. Hardebeck had heard about a man named David Bradley, who had a large plow factory in Chicago. In fact, it was a, covered a, a large area on the west side of Chicago, west of the river, and uh, I think more than a square block had no room to grow. And so Bradley was thinking maybe of finding another place to move his company to where he'd have room for expansion. Well, <clears throat> Hardebeck and a delegation of Kankakee people went up and over a period of time talked a number of times to Bradley. So, you know, you ought to consider uh, moving down here to, to North Kankakee. We've got a good labor force. We've got empty buildings. In fact, we have this huge furniture factory, Demi and Durst, which went out of business. You could just move right in there and start building plows. Yeah. I don't think in the as they do currently as far as trying to recruit industry that they were any uh, you know large tax benefit changes or anything of that sort but Bradley saw the the logic of this and in 1895 they announced that yes the Bradley factory will move to North Kankakee there was a little catch though they wanted to rename the town as well uh, the village board didn't see any problem with that so it became Bradley City uh, and the town was saved, and for many years the, the Bradley factory and its successors were a huge part of the economy of, this, of the town. <clears throat> we also were quite a, a tourism, the Kanki County area was a strong tourism destination in the 1890s. Remember, cities like Kanki, like, I'm sorry, like Chicago, were dark and smoky. They burned coal for power. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> motive power for all of the streetcars and, of course, all the in, uh, individual buggies and so forth was horses who leave deposits behind that are not exactly pleasant on the streets. The cities were not pleasant places to live and work, so people frequently said, is there some way we can get away to the country for a vacation, get out in that fresh air and, you know, enjoy something other than smog and smells. <laughs> well, yes, Kankakee was there. 1877, uh, Emery Cobb, who was a man of, of local prominence in business, uh, joined with the two, two railroads, the Big Four and the IC, and built a, an elegant hotel called the Hotel Riverview in what is now Cobb Park. Uh, it was quite an interesting place, had about 100 rooms, and what they did was promote it through the railroads. They would bring excursion trains down. People would come down and not only stay at the hotel, but they had a lot of other attractions there, you know, uh, picnic grounds and things like that. So they would bring entire train loads of, of people down to Riverview Hotel. And when they got here, there were a couple of ways to get to the Hotel Riverview. You could take a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> There was a dedicated carriage service, of course, to bring people back and forth. It was only a matter of, a, what, a mile and a half or so. A lot of people, though, went on a riverboat. Uh, Captain William Gauger had two boats, the Mini Lily and a smaller one called the Modoc. There were uh, steamboats. Uh, the Mini Lily was a side wheel paddle wheeler that docked down at the foot of, what, of Scotter Avenue. There was no Scotter Avenue bridge at that time. Uh, that was called Shaky's Landing or Shiki's Landing. And you could take a carriage ride from the, from the uh, railroad depot 
down there and climb aboard Captain Gallagher's boat and sail up the river to Hotel Riverview. It was quite a, quite a way to get there. Later, Gallagher himself opened a uh, large picnic ground resort type of thing called Gallagher's Grove south of Baker Creek along what's now Waldron Road on, this, on the east side of the river. Quite a good sized operation. They had uh, tent camping, they had cabins, uh, a lot of activities of one kind or another. And again, they promoted strongly through the railroads excursion rates uh, so you get uh, a whole train load of people coming down there. Uh, we also had, by 1891, we had a trolley uh, system in Kankakee, and that was very handy because people could come in by train and jump on the trolley and go to uh, <coughs> the Hotel Riverview for almost well, 1891. It was gone. It died. It, burned down in 1888, 18, 1897, I'm sorry. So it was there for a while. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry, 1887 is when it burned down. Okay, <laughs> check back later. Uh, the trolley eventually, the trolley company eventually set up its own tourism attraction called Electric Park, what is now Beckman Park, was um, a picnic ground. It had all kinds of activity. It had a dancing pavilion, a several hundred seat auditorium with a canvas cover for a, on inclement weather, and eventually a roller coaster. And the, if you took the trolley there, paid your five cent trolley fee f fare, you got in free. If you walked up, you had to pay a nickel at the gate to get in. World War I, things were still pretty well booming, except World War I, of course, had an incredible effect on this area. A lot of our young men went off to war. In 1918, it was a horrible flu epidemic. Uh, killed hundreds of people in, in this area and thousands and thousands worldwide. The flu epidemic was so bad here that Emergency Hospital, which was now, well, it used to be Emergency Hospital became St. Mary's, it was totally overwhelmed. And so they ended up turning the Masonic Temple on Harrison into a temporary hospital uh, for people to be treated there. A couple of uh, World War I people of note from here. Uh, in fact, in today's journal, I have a column on Father William Darsh, or Father Harris Darsh, who was the the fighting padre of World War I. He was a Marine chaplain, a uh, very heroic man, uh, ended up being gassed at Soissons, and eventually, after the war, came back and was pastor for a number of years at St. Joseph Church in, in Bradley before he died. Uh, there was also Lieutenant Pat O'Brien of Moments, who learned, learned to fly and went off to war before the United States was involved, so he joined the Canadian Air Force and ended up being, of course, in the British, the RAF, uh, was shot down over Germany and had a dramatic escape from a prison train, uh, train on the way to a prison camp, uh, survived on cabbages and whatever else he could find for close to two months while he worked his way back through enemy territory to finally get to, uh, the, the, uh, to Holland where he could be free. He was quite a celebrity and, of course, made speaking tours, wrote a book called Outwitting the Hun, uh, had a, a role in a movie, and unfortunately, either suicided or was murdered. The verdict is open in the early 1920s in, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, the coroner said it was suicide. His friends and family said, nah, but they were never able to prove it was something other than suicide. Uh, up to the 1920s. This has been a long, a long but short tour. tour. <clears throat> the Interstate Fair. The Kanki has had fairs, of course, since virtually the beginning, agricultural fairs. <clears throat> but in the early 1900s, it was called the Kanki District Fair, later became the Kanki Interstate Fair. And they were in, if you know where 
out west of, just west of Mound Grove Cemetery is Old Fair Park, uh, across from the Valspire plant. <coughs> that was the fairgrounds for both the district fair and later the interstate fair. The interstate fair was huge. It was the, the largest fair in the state of Illinois, except for the state fair for many, many years. And a great deal of that was due to a young group of young men in Kankakee who became the leaders of that fair board, including a young man named Len Small, who was the secretary for many years. They promoted the fair very strongly. They brought a lot, in addition to the, of course, agricultural aspects, uh, typical county fair things. <coughs> they built a huge grandstand. They had a racing track, had horse races, eventually automobile races. Uh, they brought in very early daredevil uh, flyers, the Moissant family, originally from Mantino, which was a, uh, a very important uh, part of the early aviation scene in this country. Uh, that kind of kicked off Len Small's political career. He was in the state legislature for number of years. Uh, he'd been a state senator. He was state treasurer in 1921. And in 1926, I'm sorry, 1920, he was elected the 26th governor of the state of Illinois. Shortly after his election, he was indicted by a grand jury maintaining that he had embezzled funds while he was a state treasurer. Well, this went on and on through a fairly lengthy trial. Uh, it was all dealing with a questionable interpretation of where state funds could be deposited by the treasurer, and eventually he was acquitted of it. Unfortunately, the day after his acquittal, his wife died. Uh, but he continued and, again, was ran for election in 1924, was reelected, and for many years continued to be very, very involved not only in local politics, but also in local agriculture and horticulture work throughout his whole life. Uh, the 1920s were a period of expansion uh, and optimism. Uh, we had a lot of building growth in this area. There was a seven-story building called the Volkman Building, which stood right next door here, built in the 1920s, that was the tallest building in Kankakee County for its entire existence uh, until it was torn down in, I believe, the 70s. But uh, also the Hotel Kankakee was built at that time. Again, that's gone. Uh, 1929 was stock market went south. The collapse of the st stock market caused the, the Great Depression, of course. We had banks failing all over the place. Our industries were laying off people. One of the responses to that by the local merchants in 1932 was kind of interesting. They held a monthly <coughs> prosperity sales day in which they had drawings for cash prizes totaling uh, $1,500. Top prize was $250, they had $100 prizes, $50 prizes, $25 prizes, and they held the drawings and announced the results in the open air at the corner of, of Schuyler and Merchant in front of the arcade building. We have photographs in the museum files taken from the top of what was later the Alden's building looking down the street and there was an incredible crowd of people, thousands of people literally filling Schuyler Avenue from side to side all the way up to Court Street. And there was another one all the way as far as, uh, as Station Street on the other side. I don't, I don't know whether it actually helped anything, but they did help a whole bunch of people individually. 1938, a casualty of the Depression as well, St. Viator's College. St. Viator's had taken out a, had, had a a fire which destroyed the gymnasium there several years earlier. They had taken out a $320,000 loan to rebuild to build the gymnasium. Well, with tough economic times, their enrollment was down. Their, they weren't able to meet the uh, payments on their loan. So eventually, the building was there foreclosed upon, and they announced in May and June of 1938 that the school was going to close. So we had this vacant school there. Well, interestingly enough, in the same year, about, oh, maybe 100, close to 100 miles to the south, 
in a little town of Olivet, Illinois, there was a small college down there that burned down. And they lost their buildings and didn't know what they were going to do. They were insured, thank goodness. So as a group of the uh, officials from Olivet were driving north to Chicago for a meeting with their insurance company, they came through Bourbonnais. And they see this big for sale sign in front of Marseille Hall uh, at Olive, or at, at St. Viator's and said, hmm, that's interesting. They got to Chicago, talked to their insurance company and found out the insurance company also owned that building. <laughs> they, had, they had been the foreclosing agency. So they worked a deal with, I think, for the, their insurance settlement from the Olivet fire and a, a not a huge amount of money, less than $100,000, uh, Olivet acquired the St. Viator campus. And by that fall, they had several hundred students in class. I'm gonna wrap up here pretty quickly, I think. Uh, World War II, of course, brought us out of the Depression uh, and war production became the way of life in our factories locally. Uh, both the Kanki Florence stove and the Bradley plant manufactured artillery shell casings by the thousands, maybe by the millions. And a lot of that output went over near Wilmington to the Elwood and the Kankakee <coughs> excuse, <coughs> munitions plants where they were loaded and sent off to, to war. We also had uh, the Bear Brand our big stocking manufacturer switched over from uh, nylon stockings and work socks to uh, olive drab stockings for the military. Commercial uniform company in the old uh, shoe factory building on 4th Avenue was at that time was owned by the commercial uniform company. They began making military uniforms. And almost every industry that had an opportunity to do so was of course handling war contracts. Uh, on June 21st, 1942, there was a terrific explosion, explosion at the Elwood munitions plant, the ordnance plant. So, so strong, in fact, it broke windows in downtown Kankakee. Uh, there were 50 people dead, quite a few, including 15 from Kankakee County, at least a couple of which were Olivet students, I believe. In August 1945, though, the war was winding down, pretty well over, and the announcement came out that the ordinance plant was gonna close. All of a sudden, there were 8,000 people out of jobs. Uh, at the same time, Florence Stowe announced that they were cutting back their workforce, so things were a little grim for a while. But soon, the post-war recovery took hold, and it was kind of a boom for Kankakee area. Uh, you know, the plants that settled here in the period from 1940s, 1950s, include uh, General Foods, the Borden operation, the big corn mill and so forth, Armstrong Cork, Armour Pharmaceutical, Gould National Battery, General Mills Chemical, A.O. Smith, including both their harvest store silo business and their water heater business. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, the Roper operation, well, what became the Roper operation, the two, the stove plant and the uh, Agricultural Machinery Division out in Bradley were both at that point under the ownership of Sears Roebuck and Company, which provided a very good market for them. Uh, so there's a lot of growth. We had a lot of jobs through the 50s and 60s. We also had retail growth, but it, it also brought change. Uh, Meadowview Shopping Center opened. And uh, Gradually, it became a point of war between that and downtown as far as who is going to get the, the, the spending dollars. And eventually, Meadowview won, of course, as we know. Uh, but we see, thank goodness, signs right now that Kanki's downtown is coming back. We had other growth, too. The, in 1948, uh, the Kanki County Historical and Arts Building opened in Small Memorial Park. That was our, our museum opened. Originally at that time we were, uh, the Historical Society shared the building with the Kanki Art League. And eventually the Art League 
moved out and, and they took over the whole thing. But we had other changes. The parks were growing, a lot of <coughs> residential growth and so forth. And on June 21, 1953, uh, we threw a big party, the Kanke County Centennial. Uh, the Centennial celebration lasted for, I believe, a full week. There were parades, uh, presentations, all of the uh, all the men grew beards and the women were <laughs> sisters of the swish, they called them, with the uh, wearing uh, or long dresses and so forth. Uh, there was a big pageant at the fairgrounds that involved hundreds and hundreds of people. So we've now come full circle from that train that came through on the 4th of July, 1853 to June 21, 1953, the first century of Kanke County's existence. Thank you very much. We'll take questions if anybody has them. I may have to ask someone who is, uh, hears better than I do, my hearing aids are not that great, to help me <laughs> by repeating the answers so I can hear it. Any questions? Yes, sir. My name is David Chobar, C-H-O-B-A-R. Chobar's Crossing. Only uh, by, excuse me, I'm gonna sit down for a moment. My knees are just locked up from standing in one spot. Ah. Ooh, all right, there we go. For many years it was known, uh, the area that is now uh, Aroma Park was known in many ways as Shobar's Crossing. Well, let me get the microphone. Oops. Oh, thank you. I think I should do that before I sat down. The area, uh, Waldron or Roma Park, was known as Showbar's Crossing because it was a, a ford on the river where you could get across the river in the days before bridges. According to some of the notes we have, the, there was a trader named Isidore Showbar, I believe is one of the, the names that we've seen. It's not very well documented, but who was trading at that area in about the 1820s, 1822 or 23, uh, supposedly uh, that was one of the, he was one of the competitors of, uh, of Hubbard and uh, Levasseur when they set up at Buncombe, which was of course would be the next town or next spot down the line. Uh, I also recently was looking at an abstract from the Mexicatino Potawatomi Reservation, which of course was Two, uh, two sections of land at what is now Roma. And there was a note in there that among the reservations, the, the reservation was Mexicatino and her children. And one of those children was listed as George Shobar. So it, would, it might have been a, uh, you know, <coughs> and, I, and that's the only, and I haven't had a chance to, re I just saw that last week, I haven't had a chance to re research it any further, but it's a possibility that George Schober, Schobar was, of course, somewhere in the, in the line of ancestry. But that's really about all we have on that. It's just uh, pretty much a uh, anecdotal information. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, what? Not well, I'm sorry. Flickerville. Oh, Flickerville, yeah. Ah. You know, that's an area, again, that I, I don't know an awful lot about, to be honest. I, I'm familiar with the name, and that's about it, unfortunately. Any other questions? Well, if not, I thank all of you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't put anybody to sleep this afternoon or this morning. It could be afternoon. It might have seemed like I talked that long. <laughs> but uh, I hope you will all become loyal readers every Saturday of uh, my Looking Back column in the journal. Uh, and also, uh, I know you take advantage of the room on the third floor here because you're all members of the Genealogical Society, which is one of my hangouts, too, although I'm not a member, I probably should be, 
but uh, I haunt the microfilm machines down there because there are a lot of my research work is done with them. Uh, but I would also invite all of you, if you're not members or at least if you're not familiar with us, please visit us at the Kankakee County Museum uh, over in Small Park. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon and on Saturdays from 1 to 4. And of course our French Heritage Museum is open from 1 to 4 on Saturdays through about nine months of the year. We close down in the winter time because uh, combination of heating and not that many people want to be there at that hour at that time. But at the museum we have a, a lot of good reference material. We have an excellent researcher, Jory, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Jory Walters, who is our research coordinator, uh, is a whiz when it comes to finding any information and she has helped a lot of people. Uh, so again, thank you one and all. That's probably almost time for lunch. <laughs>